Brad and I are going to get into this up next right here in your home for Common Sense Radio. Oil, gas, politics, the budget, and more. He's a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, now founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He joins us this morning to talk about, uh, well, talk about new revenues, talk about the gas line and the new IRS determination, and even the efficacy of that uh, oil and gas tax credit that we were just talking about here. Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm good. Apparently not as good as you watching the rolling hills of Ireland, but, you know, I guess that's <laughs> that's how... That's how we roll around here, right? Just just another beautiful day in paradise for you. Well, somebody has to do it, so I, I, so I volunteer. You know what? I'm glad you're taking one for the team, Brad. Thanks for being there and shielding <laughs> us from all that bad stuff out there. Um, let's, <laughs> let's, let's work. I want to get into this IRS determination that's been reported on by the Alaska Journal of Commerce. But we were just talking about this uh, story on the um, – uh, on the new oil, uh, the, the cash credit program, and how the new one applies, and how we continue to hear these stories about how, oh, we're shortchanging the uh, we're shortchanging the oil companies, and we're not living up to our promises, and look at how much good this program actually did, and all this other stuff. There's a lot of fallacies in these stories that are coming out. I just want to again revisit one more time the real truth about what these cash credits mean what the actual cost is, what we're really obligated to pay, and how, you know, what the efficacy, as I said earlier, that uh, this program really showed. So let's let's jump into that real quick before we jump into the uh, gas line issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where do you want to start? Well, let, let's talk for a second just about what's really owed, because we keep hearing about, oh, well, they're expecting all this money. They're expecting this and they're expecting that. But, I mean, written into these agreements, in the fine print, I mean, and you are a former attorney for the oil companies, you know they're reading every bit of that fine print. There's a, you know, there's a little clause that says, hey, we're subject to appropriation, so we guarantee this minimum amount. Everything above that is pretty much gravy. Yeah, it wasn't even fr fine print. I mean, in the statute from the beginning of the program in, in the about 2007 time frame, in the statute from the beginning has been a provision that says, the state has an obligation uh, to pay each year a given percentage of what it receives in production tax revenues, and it may pay more than that. That's what the statute has always said. The state has always complied every year, including this year, last year, whatever year you want to pick, the state has always complied with the obligation uh, with respect to that percentage of the production tax revenues. What, what the, what the, issue is, um, is that the producers, uh, the companies that, that were engaged in this program, sort of thought the state would always add in more uh, along the way if that, if that per percentage of production tax revenues uh, wasn't sufficient. But the state never promised that. We have people out there who say, oh, but there was a brochure, and the brochure said we'd always be there. Well, the brochure was subject to the statute. The statute was clear. <laughs> that we would be there, the state would be there to the extent of the percent of production tax revenue. And if production tax revenue went down, that, uh, that amount of money that would go into the program would go down with it. Essentially, what that provision was, was a risk, risk sharing. It was if, we, if the state's production tax revenue went down because of production decline or because of oil price, uh, oil price decline, then the producers, the, the companies that were engaged in the program, would, would see the period of time over which they would be paid back lengthen out because the annual contribution would go down as the production tax revenue went right. down. Well, guess what? In 2014, uh, oil prices dropped. Production taxes went down. The level of production taxes went down, have stayed down uh, since. And the state is merely living up to the part of its part of the bargain by saying, "Look, we will continue, even though it's costing us, even though even though you know we could put this money perhaps to better use, we will continue to live up to our part of the bargain, which is to give you to put into the program a percentage of the production tax. But you have to live up to your part of the bargain, which was you accepted a part of this risk, and the and the payments are going to be lengthened out." The, the, the companies are trying a PR program, essentially, spinning it every way they can, 
um, uh, to say, look, you know, we, we want more money. We, 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 we spent more, we want more, and we want it now. But that's not what the statute provides. That's not what the statute has ever provided. And, right. and, and, and people who are saying differently, news outlets are saying differently, aren't being careful with the facts. They aren't going back and talking to experts and understanding uh, what this program actually was. The other thing that really frosts me is this continued discussion on look at how much they've already done for us. Look at how much these cre- these these earned credits have have already done and how successful they've been. Uh, and they may point to one or two things, but you've laid out the fact that if you look at it as an overall return on investment, you realize this is not, this is not a, a glowing recommendation for this uh, program. No, we haven't even to, to we've spent about. $4 billion uh, in cash on this program uh, so far. Uh, no one's demonstrated, and, and, and if you look at the numbers, you can't find that we've even, the state's even recovered that amount of money, much less produced a return on that investment. If we had taken that $4 billion and invested it alongside the permanent fund in stocks and bonds and, and, and other things that the permanent fund invests in, uh, we would have been producing money. Uh, from day one, we would have produced money on that investment. Uh, we haven't done anything close to, by putting the money instead in this program, we haven't done anything close to producing, uh, even recovering the money back, much less producing a return on the investment. So the state, if you look at it from an opportunity cost standpoint, what is it we, the state could have done with that money had they not put it in this program what was the alternative to the money by not putting it in the program? If you look at it from an opportunity cost standpoint, we've lost money. We've lost right. the opportunity uh, to earn that additional money that we would have had we invested it. What, what's really – I mean the people who have benefited here are, are the service companies, and I have, no, I have no problem with the service companies, but the oil field service companies who got additional activity uh, uh, out of this program – that, that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have uh, as much. Uh, and, and, what's, and what's really you know, bothering people now is the companies aren't getting paid, so perhaps paid back as rapidly as they, as they hoped they would. Uh, and, and so the service companies aren't getting the additional activity. Uh, and you see that, I, you sent me the link to the, to the article where Chenault, uh, uh, Representative Chenault is interviewed. I mean, you see that coming through in that article uh, what's, what's really important to Nikiski, to the Kenai, is the service industry down there. Right. And what the real right. complaint is, is our service industry isn't, isn't getting, you know, these dollars. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's what the program provided. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so I just want to, again, offer some counterpoint because it seems like every story, whether it's KTVA or the ADN or, or, you know, some of these others, it seems like every story only gets the one side of it, the oil company or the the support industry side of it. They never seem to get the true, you know, all the facts of it. And that's that that saddens me in that regard, because we really need to have all sides of that story. Um, it. it- Liz, Liz Rains tried. Liz Rains did a follow-up actually after our segment last week. I don't know if our, I don't know if, if that discussion generated it or not, but but KTVA and Liz Rains did a did another story on it last week, and they still didn't get it right. I mean, it they still didn't talk about the statutory what the statutory the limits of the statutory obligation and what the state was actually is actually obligated to do. It, it's, it was still the spin of, oh, my gosh, you know, we're shortchanging the companies. We promised them all this money. We're not paying the money, and, we, and, we're, and we're leaving them high and dry with that. It, we never, the state never, ever, ever promised, promised this money. One, one, one thing that would be interesting, if somebody really wanted to do a deep dive, uh, good story on this, is to go back and talk to uh, now Senator, then DNR Commissioner Dan, Dan Sullivan, and Joe Balash, those were the two commissioners, the DNR commissioners that were in office at the time. Everybody claims these promises were made. Um, neither of those could have promised what the companies are now claiming was promised uh, because the statute didn't authorize it. But it would be interesting to ask them if they, if even if the statute didn't authorize it, they were out there making making promises, more promises than the statute authorized, 
or if they were, as they should have been, being careful and saying, but you need to go read uh, the statute. That's, that, that's the story that's not being pursued right now. What did Dan Sullivan and what did Joe Balash tell these companies, and did they tell them something different uh, than what was in the statute? I think it's a valid question. I think somebody should be asking it. Um, all right, let's 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 dive down into some of the, the other news, though. One of the things that we've just heard about, of course, is the fact that the IRS came back with a determination letter for AGDC and the Alaska Gas Line Project. Uh, they had finally submitted to IRS and say, hey, look, we believe that we're a, a tax-free entity. And what say you? The IRS came back and said, yep, you're a political subdivision of the state, which means you don't have, you're not subject to federal income taxes. Plus, it opens up a whole host of other things. Give us your take on this. Well, I, it's a good thing. Um, one, of, one of the reasons that, that the companies um, – uh, we're comfortable uh, in some respects. We're comfortable with the state getting out in the lead uh, was because the state uh, has the potential to be a tax-free uh, entity. When, when a company owns a property, and it has to pay taxes on the revenue, and so that's part of the cost and so, of the project, and so that's part of what has to be factored into the, into the rates or into the, into the calculation of their economics. If the, state, if the state could do it and not be a tax-paying entity, not have to pay taxes, then we avoid that cost with respect to the project, and the rates, the tariffs, the cost of the project can be lower uh, and moves it more toward being an, a, an economic project. That was one of the advantages of the state taking, taking an, a, 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 lead, a lead role with respect to the project. At the time that, that we had hearings on this back last year, uh, when the company said they were going to step back and the state said it was going to step up, uh, there was doubt expressed uh, in those hearings by some that the state could get uh, such a determination uh, from the IRS, that it could get a determination of being uh, a tax-free entity. Um, and, and that was part of the reason that, that everybody was uh, concerned about, the, about this turn in the project, part of the reason there are others. But part of the reason everybody was concerned about this turn in the project, um, the state went through it, went, went through the process, and has now gotten this determination. So it offers the possibility of, of lowering the cost of this project even further. If you can lower the cost enough, uh, you can make the project uh, economic. Every little bit helps, uh, and making this a, a tax-free project uh, is, uh, is, is, is a significant uh, help uh, to bringing the cost down and making the project more economic. Doesn't guarantee it's going to be economic. Doesn't guarantee we're going to get customers. Uh, we're in the middle of an open season process that, that will sort of suss that out. Uh, but it does lower the cost in a way that, uh, that is helpful to making the pro moving, moving the project closer to being economic. And that, of course, is not just to the fact that the that the uh, that they don't have to pay taxes, but that it also means that they have access to different types of financing and other things that'll make the overall project more viable from a standpoint of their profitability. It basically has to be almost half of what a private entity's profitability has to be to be able to uh, make it feasible, right? Well, it doesn't have to be half, but it has to be it has to be less. I mean, where we were last. Last uh, last summer, uh, when when uh, Wood McKenzie, one of the best oil analysts out there, private consulting oil analysts out there, said the project at, at its current structure wasn't economic. Um, uh, what they said was this was they suggested this is one way to try to get the cost down to turn it into a tax-free entity. And you're right. Uh, not only does this potentially affect whether the project would have to pay taxes on the revenue it receives. It also affects whether financing bonds uh, that it might issue uh, could be tax-free to investors, and if they're tax-free to investors, then they, they, they come at a lower cost. You can get a lower cost uh, of financing if you can issue tax-free bonds. So it does, it does uh, help uh, the project from, from that standpoint as well. The project still has to get customers, right? I mean, it's still <laughs> – the fact, the fact that it's tax-free <laughs> – does, doesn't guarantee that it's going to work. It still has to go out and get customers, but customers are going to be looking at the costs 
Um, and AGDC has got to be looking at the financing, uh, and, and it just makes those two pieces um, easier. What does this what does this say for yesterday? I had a call from the North Slope. A guy said, "You know, Mike, what do you think is the what do you think is the long term prospects of the of an Alaskan gas line?" And I said at the time, I said, based on what I've seen, based on the past, based on everything else, I said I don't think we'll have one in ten years, but in twenty years we very well could have. Do you think that 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 I'm being too pessimistic, too optimistic? What do you think is going on from your point of view? Well, I think, I think, frankly, there's a chance you're being too pessimistic. Um, the AGDC, AGDC right now is in the middle of, of what they call an open season, um, and, and they've asked for offers, non-binding offers, but offers by the end of the month from potential shippers. Um, there is some rumbling out there that, that they're getting some decent response to that. The IRS ruling will be helpful in that in that they can you know that tends to move the cost downward on the project tends to increase the ability to get lower cost financing um and and so that will be helpful to the process um there is there's a growing lng demand in the world i mean you you look at people like shell um the global company that says they're stepping back from oil they're looking more at natural gas as being where they're going in the future um you look at China, other places, there is a growing LNG demand. It's just finding right. a role for Alaska to fit in. Welcome back to the Michael Duke Show. You're over Common Sense Radio every week. Brad Keithley and I get a chance to dissect things in the state in regards to oil and gas, politics, and more. He joins us this morning as we continue ahead. Uh, any final thoughts on that uh, IRS determination on the gas line, Brad? Do you think that, I mean, how much, how far do you think this is advances our timeline? I said 10 years. You say maybe a little pessimistic. Where do you think we end up? Oh, I, I, I <laughs> well, that's, that's hard to predict. But I, but I think there's a chance. I mean, let, let me try it this way. I think there's a chance uh, that, that the current open season process is enough to, shows enough uh, interest that we continue on from that, um, and I think there's a chance that next year uh, we we are able to reach some binding uh, commitments, and then we go we we step off into the next phase. I'm, at that point, we'll need to have a discussion about what the next phase is. I'm concerned about the state actually engineering this project. Uh, I think we need to bring private companies back in uh, to have a significant role at the time we step into engineering. Uh, but I think there's a chance that, they, that they're getting the cost down enough, uh, that there's a growing enough demand for LNG, that Alaska is well-placed enough, uh, and that we have uh, a, a good enough uh, project to bring together, economic project to bring together, that, that we can play a role in the expanding LNG market. I, I would not say absolutely that we're not going to have this project um, uh, inside of 10 years, I would not say that we're not going to have this project inside of five years. The odds probably aren't greater than 50-50. Maybe they aren't greater than 40-60, uh, but they aren't zero. Um, and I think uh, the IRS ruling moves us closer to that by helping to bring down costs a little bit more and providing a po uh, an avenue for lower cost financing than we were otherwise going to have for the project. Okay. Well, that, that kind of sums it up. Now, I want to take a tack here on something that you and I have been talking about. You and I have been talking about for a long time that really there's no need in all this hand-wringing that's been going on. There's really no need to continue this discussion on new revenue for a multiplicity of reasons. You know, the, the effects on the economy just about the discussion, the true effects on the economy if something like this actually goes in, the fact that we have a good, uh, that we have a good uh, savings account, that we have the Hammond 5050 plan as a template to use, all these different reasons. The problem is, you and I were discussing last week, we may have been wrong in this. Not the fact that we were wrong and that it couldn't be done, is that there is simply just no interest on our leaders' part to actually even look at this idea. They are so hell-bent on revenues that maybe what we should have been doing was pointing out the least worst option this entire time, and so we wanted to take a crack at that today. Yeah, absolutely. I the. The frustration level uh, uh, of, of how we've been going in the state and how the legislature has been going in the state, at least my frustration level, is fairly high. 
we, we, I think there is an alternative. We've talked about it a lot on the show, but it requires you to get spending down to around four billion dollars, uh, and, right. and requires you to to uh, to look at realistic oil and gas uh, oil prices going forward, realistic production levels going forward. I think I think where where that falls apart is I don't think we have a leadership either in the legislature either body of the legislature or in the governor's office that's willing to look at a $4 billion total uh, operating and capital uh, uh, spending uh, limit. I think they, I think the general consensus is they want more. And if you want more, <laughs> you, you can't do it from, from a sustainable standpoint from our current assets, asset base, you are going to have to have new revenue. So if right. that's where we're going, if we're going, if, if we can't get spending down within sustainable limits, then yeah, we need to be talking about new revenue. They've been doing it for a while. They've gone off on on the path of cutting the PFD uh, as 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 the path for raising new revenue. Um, and and I think from my standpoint, I need to get in the mix of that discussion because I think that's going off on the on the wrong track. If we're going to talk about new revenue, we need to talk about what's best for the overall economy and what's best for Alaska families in raising that new revenue. Well, and that's been the discussion. And again, I don't want people to hear what we're not saying. Brad and I have been saying for going on two years now that we do not need a new revenue source in the state if we are willing to make the tough choices and do what we need to do. And overall, for the economy, that would be best. Both of those things, both taking control of the spending and avoiding new taxes would be best for the economy. We've been saying that now for two years. So I don't want people to hear what we're not saying. We are not an advocate of taxation, but if that is the road that we are going to go down and it seems like all indications are nobody has any interest in any other option, that the least that we could do is point to the least worst option of everything on the table. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and all of the analyses but what's really ironic about this is that all of the analyses that have been done, all the economic analyses, say the PFD, cutting the PFD, is the worst of, of all the options from the standpoint of the overall Alaska economy, from the standpoint of Alaska families, from the standpoint of what it does to government costs uh, in terms of increasing poverty and thus increasing uh, uh, support costs that we have that, we, that, that exist in this state and elsewhere. Uh, it's the worst thing that you can do, cutting the PFD is the worst thing you can do from those standpoints. Um, so it, if we're interested in the overall economy, if we're interested in Alaska families, uh, then we need to be talking about other alternatives other than, uh, other than the PFD cuts. What, uh, so, so when we look at all the options, you and I have talked about the varying different displays. Obviously, the ICER report says, uh, as you just said, the PFD, which is a tax, again, I'll point out, is a tax, no matter what they want to call it, uh, is the worst case. The second is the income tax. What does that leave on the table for us to really grapple with here to say, okay, of all the things, this is this is the best of the poisons that are on the table? Well, there's there's two things. There's three things, one of which can be immediately dismissed. One that ICER analyzed uh, was a statewide property tax. Uh, this, we don't we don't have the records. We don't have anywhere near the ability to implement a statewide property tax in the state. So you sort of you sort of say, yeah, that was nice to analyze, but but it's not realistic to implement. And you take and you take it off the table. That leaves two things. One is a sales tax, which there are advocates of, uh, and and which we can discuss the merits of. Uh, and the other is a flat tax. Uh, which has been the traditional conservative approach if you have to new, raise new revenues at the federal level and in a lot of other states and a number of other states, uh, is to have a flat tax. And a flat tax is a flat, consistent percent uh, of income um, uh, across all income classes. Uh, and and, and doesn't, doesn't, it's not a progressive income tax in that it doesn't charge those at the higher end of the income classes more, uh, it's not a regressive income tax in the sense that it charges those at the lower uh, end of the income, uh, in income spectrum more. It charges a consistent uh, percentage uh, across, the, across the board. Frankly, from my standpoint, the flat tax is the, is, makes the most sense 
uh, of of what we're facing, given what we're facing in this state. Just to give you an example, the the current approach, the current Senate approach, was which is to cut the PFD. Uh, when you apply that on a on an income scale or on on, on the income scale, that takes 30 percent of the income of the lowest 20 percent of Alaskans, the lowest 20 percent of Alaska families. It takes 15 percent, 16 percent of the of the income family income of the next 20 percent. Takes 8 percent of the income of the next of the next 20 percent. We're up in the in the middle income now between 40 and 60 percent. But when you get to the highest 20 percent, the, the PFD cut approach takes less than 2 percent uh, of their income. So you're, you're going if you if you use if you use a PFD cut, you're going from taking 30 percent of the lowest uh, in income class, 30 percent of their income and only and taking less than 2 percent of the highest uh, income class. Huge uh, disproportionate effects uh, between between the income classes. What a flat tax would do is say to raise the same amount of money as the, as the rev as the Senate's proposing would say okay we're going to take 2.75 percent from all the income classes highest income class uh, next income class down next income class down next income class down and the lowest income class and the way you take it from the lowest income class will usually complain and say oh well they don't they don't file income taxes so income tax returns so you can't yeah. assess it against them well you can take it as withholding against the PFD. Um, a 2.5 percent withholding against the income that's otherwise being derived from the PFD, and 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 apply it to the lowest income class uh, uh, also. So you can take a consistent amount uh, across the board. That, in my opinion, has the lowest adverse effect on the overall economy because you're treating everybody fairly. It has the lowest adverse effect on Alaska families because you're treating everybody fam uh, fairly. Um, and it's the fairest approach because you're not assessing one, you're not hurting one income class uh, essentially to subsidize another. Well, and, and that, you know, I could already hear the screaming and the screeching happening over the fact that, well, this is, uh, even though it's only 10% of their, or whatever the num magic number is, 5%, 10%, whatever it is, you know, you're, that, that that has a larger effect on them because they have a, the, on the lower incomes because and it, it's the same kind of argument we see in a sales tax because it's regressive and it hurts them more than it does the higher income classes, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, the bottom line is that there's no tax that's going to be equitable all the way around. But this would at least equalizes the playing field on a raw number standpoint. Right. Well, exactly. And it, and it's and it's not regressive. I mean, it's flat. It, it affects everybody. Uh, uh, the same across the board. It also has the benefit, Michael, I think, of putting everybody in the game equally in terms of being concerned about government costs. I mean, one of the problems we have, frankly, is that is that higher income Alaskans uh, aren't as concerned about government costs. They say they are, but they don't have. If if the if the effect on them of a PD cut is less than two percent, a lot of them say, most of them say, all of them say, well, I can afford that. Um, so yeah, let's do a PFD cut. Let's raise additional revenue by doing by doing a PFD cut. If you if you charge everybody equally, if everybody has to play a, has to pay an equal amount, everybody has the same skin in the game in in terms of trying to bring costs down. Some people argue that that that's one of the benefits of a progressive income tax, raising more taxes from higher income Alaskans because that will cause them to be more active in trying to keep government costs down. I'm not sure that's right, but I do think having a, a flat percentage of everybody across the board, a flat income tax, a uh, flat tax across the board, um, uh, has the benefit of ha everybody having uh, equal skin in the game. And it doesn't adversely affect, doesn't disproportionately hit uh, one income class over another. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd really love to find out where we go from here or what you think we need to do. Well, I want to find out more. We'll be checking back in with you next week. Thank you, Brad Keithley. Michael, thank you. As always, enjoy lovely Ireland there. Back with more. The Michael Duke Show continues. Hour 3 dead ahead on Oldies 102.1 and AM 700 K.